In the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, Kant doesn't do anything so easy as just to say what the basic principle or the categorical imperative is. And there's two reasons for that. One, because it's not easy, and Kant's never, at the best of times, somebody who can really put his finger on something in a concise and clear form of words. He, his style of writing tends to be rather convoluted and German. But also because um, if he did give a very simple principle, there's a danger that people might take that principle and start acting on it without really thinking it through. And that would take people away from fulfilling their nature. It would undermine their freedom. And in fact, people would be less good than they might have been if they weren't taking the principle into account in the first place. So Kant has a bit of a dilemma. On one hand, he wants to help people to make a decision, but on the other hand, giving them too much help might take them away from this idea of rationality and freedom. So he comes up with a compromise. That is giving six different forms of words, six different definitions of the categorical imperative, broadly speaking, three different maxims on which people should act. Now, it's important to remember that these versions of the categorical imperative were never designed to be used separately, nor to indicate different courses of action to be right, but rather that the different forms of words were intended to be compared and contrasted by individuals so that they could weigh them up and use them as just guidelines in making their own rational and free decisions. So what are these versions of the categorical imperative? Well, the first and the most famous version of the Kantian imperative is uh, always act so that the maximum of your actions should become through your will a universal law. It's a complex form of words, but a, basically it's asking you to think what would happen if everybody else did the same? So if I decide that I want to kill Auntie Sally in order to inherit her millions, I need to think, well, what would I do if everybody did the same? Would I accept that as a rational human being? And if everyone just killed off their friends and relatives in order to inherit, the world would certainly not be a good place. And in fact, if I broaden things out and think about what would happen if everybody was allowed to take another life just when they felt like it, the world would be a really terrible place. And therefore, I should realise that my killing Aunt Sally is no different from anybody else killing somebody else for, for the fun of it. Um, and therefore, that I shouldn't accept this action of mine. Basically, you're taking yourself out of the particular situation and thinking about the general principle, thinking about a rule that applies to everybody rather than working on the principle of one law for me and another for you. So in that sense, it's, it's very much common sense. It's very simple. The second version of the categorical imperative is sometimes called the practical imperative, and it asks us always to treat people as ends in themselves rather than as means to an end. What does this mean? Basically, it's just asking us not to use people, to think about this principle of empathy. Rational people can put, pe put themselves into other people's shoes and imagine what it would be like to be them. And what Kant is asking us to do is to realise that there's no essential difference between ourselves and, and other human beings, and therefore we should do to others as we would like them to do to us. We should always value people's humanity and never use people as a means to an end. So this means in practice that if, let's say, in, an, in a dramatic moral situation, we're asked to shoot one person in a prisoner of war camp in order to save a whole lot of others, it would be wrong to sacrifice that one person by using them as a means to an end of saving others, because doing so would uh, trivialise or devalue humanity. We should make a stand and refuse to do that sort of thing, because the broader impact and the precedent that it sets is uh, more significant than the individual situation. So the broader impact of standing up for human life and refusing to take it in that situation is going to be more important in the long run than the lives of the five or the ten people that you might have saved um, by committing that crime. The third version of the categorical imperative is similar and asks us to think of ourselves as a law-making member of a kingdom of ends. What does that mean? Basically, he's asking us to consider what would happen if everybody did the same, as in the first instance, and to consider the equality between ourselves and everybody else, as in the practical imperative. Basically, to think about the precedent or the example that our actions set. It's something that teachers often say to pupils and parents often say to children, this idea of setting an example for others.
But Kant thinks that this is a really important part of being a rational person. We must appreciate that no man is an island in the work of Shakespeare, that when we act, other people see us acting and see in our decisions a justification for doing much the same themselves. So we must always think of setting an example for others and acting in a way that is morally brainless and we will be happy for others to imitate. Now for Kant, if we do these three things, if we consider what would happen if everybody did the same, if we consider using people as uh, ends in themselves rather than as means to an end, and if we consider of acting as a law-making member of a kingdom of ends, then we're acting as a rational and free being. And as a full human being, we're contributing to a, a better world. And indeed Kant saw things very much in this sense. One of the criticisms that's often levelled at Kantian ethics is that people often don't see the, the reward or the benefit for doing the right thing in the here and now. And Kant was fully aware of this. He realised that many people would be made quite miserable by acting according to principle. But, he believed, in the long run, both individually and as a society, we would see the benefits. We would have rational satisfaction of knowing that we'd acted on principle and we'd acted rationally and freely and we'd become fully human uh, and accepted that responsibility within our own lives. But in a broader sense, in the bigger picture, the world would gradually become a better place with everybody acting, aware of the precedents that they're setting, valuing humanity and abiding by a general principle that's equal for everybody, not one law for one person and another law for another.